Uh, thank you, Hans Rudolf. I will begin and then uh, Wolfgang will actually show how this works in reality. Um, I'm just gonna show you a few examples and then Wolfgang will show, show, the, show to you how this looks like on obviously SARS-CoV-2 data. That's the beast of the day as usual. Um, so I, so um, Galaxy was initially developed as a kind of an easy to use system for biologists to analyze large data sets on the web. So it, you know, it, it pairs graphical user interface with powerful compute infrastructure. However, uh, this also created a number of misconceptions about Galaxy. Uh, and these misconceptions, some of them stem from the fact that kind of a real developers don't use graphical interfaces. They do everything in bash. It's a, sort of a cultural difference a bit. It's like here in the US, some people wear masks and some don't, it's just a cultural preference. But uh, hopefully uh, today's uh, webinar will um, refute some of these misconceptions. So, uh, because Today's webinar is really about scaling, and this is how you can analyze thousands of data sets. Um, and it, so you, you will see how this can be done with a graphical user interface. However, again, for some of these ideas that uh, you know, Galaxy is not suitable for large scale bioinformatics, Galaxy can be used for scripting. In particular, I want to uh, focus your attention on the webinar, which will be next week uh, about uh, Jupyter and our studio. Uh, Galaxy has a full featured API, so it can be used from command line, for example, to trigger workflow uh, invocations. It integrates with Jupyter and our studio, as I already said, and you can also stream these data in observable HQ. So uh, it's, it really can do whatever you need it to do. But uh, today's conversation about how you can process multiple data sets. So the problem with multiple data sets and uh, graphical user interface is that, you know, if you have a thousand or 10,000 samples, just imagine clicking on 10,000 things. This is why I have this carpal tunnel syndrome here because that's the best way to experience it. So it's not something you want to do. You don't want to click through uh, many, many data sets. However, the nature of today's biology is that it's kind of cheap to generate multiple data sets. So how do we deal with 10 to the X data sets in Galaxy? Uh, so before I begin, uh, I can probably stick uh, this in the chat. There is a, there is a link here. So uh, there's a number of videos that um, explain uh, what we do with collections. So I will, I will stick this URL in the chat. Let me do that. And uh, you can see here, you will see uh, videos which start with data set collections. So a lot of things that I'm gonna uh, talk about today are, are also described in this video. So if you uh, can you know, watch them over and over again, and you can see that these videos are ra rather short. So let me go and uh, stick this in the chat so you guys can have that. Okay, so this is the link to this particular um, playlist. So this is kind of an overview. So what today we're gonna to talk about data set collections. It's a concept in Galaxy, which allows you to package multiple data set, doesn't matter how many, you can package two, you can package 20,000, uh, but it's a container. And this container is presented to you in the Galaxy user interface as one thing. So you really only need to click once. And this, is, this shows a kind of a typical uh, life cycle for a collection. And once I'll start showing you examples, this will uh, start making sense. But essentially, for example, you wanna pull down, uh, say a fraction of a COG UK data or some large data set. Here I just, you know, out of the blue, a list of 20,000, but it can be now any number of data sets. So you, you upload them into Galaxy and you package them in one thing. You see one item in your interface. Once I'll start again showing you examples, you see that. And then all the processing 
from your standpoint, from the standpoint of the user, happens on, on this one thing. And behind the scenes, of course, when you do things like mapping things, well, any, essentially any operation, like, you know, variant calling, and it doesn't matter. This is variant calling example, but imagine they're in a seek or cheap seek or anything that you want to do. So underneath that, Galaxy knows that, in fact, this single thing, the singular collection contains, for example, 20,000 data sets. So I need to start 10,000 BWA jobs behind the scenes. And then these BWA results get packaged as another collection and so on. And in the end, we also provide tools which allow you to, uh, to um, well, what's, the, what's the word here, to collapse this into, in the end, a singular one tabular data set, because ultimately this is what you want. Because this is, you start with raw data, you get to the tabular data set, and then, or, or any other kind of data set, it could be JSON, could be tabular, whatever. And then this is, this is already intermediate results, which you further process with tools, for example, like Jupyter or RStudio to generate publishable figures. Because obviously you don't publish short reads, you don't publish intermediate data set, you publish your final interpretation. Uh, uh, Galaxy contains, so I just explained to you that there is a, um, there is a way to generate collections. And we also provide a number of tools for manipulating these collections. And I'm, I'm not gonna talk about all of these tools today, but I'm gonna highlight some of the most powerful tools because in this list, probably the really two killer tools here are the column join and collapse collection. I mean, their, their names kind of uh, maybe don't immediately uh, uh, picture that they're very powerful, but this is, it's, it's just, it's, they're, they're, they're very useful tools. Okay, so um, let me, let's begin with uh, creating a collection. Uh, so I'll switch to Galaxy here. And uh, so this is Galaxy. And here I have six data sets. Um, they're the same, there's the same data sets. It's in this case, it's just FastQ files, tiny FastQ files. I, you know, I, I, I made kind of a, a bogus data set for this, for this webinar because I want to show key concepts and then Wolfgang will show you how it actually operates uh, in, in real life. So um, normally when we create collection, we expect that it's gonna be homogeneous in terms of types of the data that you have there. For example, all of these are FASTQ files. So it's gonna be one collection with FASTQ files. There is no uh, explicit requirement for that. I mean, you can obviously put different types of data into collection, but uh, the, the classical use is that the collection is homogeneous from the standpoint of what data you have there. So this is the simplest possible case. Uh, let's suppose this is a result of single and uh, Illumina sequencing. So I have six or 60 or 6,000 or 60,000 files and I want to package them into a collection. So in order to do that, there is this uh, checkbox which allows me to select data sets. I'm just gonna select them all or you can click select all. And now for all selected, I want to build data set list. And this will uh, trigger this pop-up. I can name it something like this, you know, my list, and uh, just click create list. And so what you see now is that instead of the six data sets or 60 or 600 or 60,000, you have just one element in your uh, history you can expand it so you will see the data sets that are there, but um, but uh, but you don't have to. You don't have to look. So it's it's represented as a singular item. So uh, this is one example, and I will show you uh, in, in in the next few minutes how tools recognize collections because ultimately when you run BWA or Bowtie or any other tool in the collection, the tool needs to know that this is a collection, not just a singular data set. 
So, uh, but before I do this, I just need to introduce you to two fundamental types of collections. So this is just a simple list. It's just a flat list of data sets uh, uh, packaged into a single container. But uh, in real life, especially when we are dealing with Illumina data, data sets are usually have hierarchy to them. So uh, the simplest hierarchy that you can have is paired end data. So that means that for every sample, you actually have two files, one file for forward reads and one file for reverse reads. So we also, we developed collections in such a way that they can uh, accommodate that structure. So let's make a, uh, let's make a um, paired collection. So uh, in this case, I have three samples now. You can, see, you can see that I have sample A, I have sample B, and I have sample C. Uh, and they're labeled underscore F for forward reads, underscore R for reverse reads, and so on. So three samples, six files, because it's a, a paired end sequencing data. So again, uh, let me just select the things that I want. Um, and for all the selected lists, now I am going to build list of data set pairs, not a single data set, but list of data set pairs. Of course, when you're creating a list of, of data set pairs, you need to ensure that they're paired properly. I mean, you don't want to pair forward reads from sample A with reverse reads from sample C. Uh, so this wizard, which, which gets popped out, uh, it sort of takes care of that. Uh, so let me just cancel for a second. Uh, so what's common about these uh, names is that, so all the forward reads are underscore F and all the reverse reads are underscore R. So let's go back here again. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just going to clear, enter underscore F, underscore R. And so Galaxy is smart enough that it knows that it needs to pair sample A with uh, forward with sample A reverse and so on. And we can auto pair them or I can explicitly click on these and create these pairs. And um, I, similarly, I can um, name these and this will create and uh, click and, and create the list. So, well, I, as you can see, I already did this when I was kind of rehearsing this, uh, but let's look at this collection. Uh, so now if you click on it, you will see your three samples, but once you click on every sample, you will have these forward and reverse reads now. So this collection, this, uh, this now has hierarchy. Uh, the collection functionality is not limited to just paired data sets. You can imagine complex data set arrangements where, for example, you analyze cases and controls. Each case has, say, males and females. Each male and female are smokers, non smokers, and for each of them, you have paired or forward reads. You can actually create collection which has nested levels representing each of these uh, each of these layers. But uh, let's see. So I just explained how we create simple lists. I just explained how we create uh, these paired end collections. So how do tools view them? So um, let's just um, let's look, for example, at mapping tools. It doesn't matter which tool. I don't know. Let's look at BWA MEM. So all these tools, um, they have. Um, they allow you to specify that you would like to enter not individual data sets, but actually data set collections. And you do that, for example, in case of BWA by selecting what kind of data you have. So in this case, we have paired collection. And so you can see that it recognizes that. I actually have two paired end collections there. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, if, if I actually start mapping job on this collection, what would happen is that it will actually start three jobs because I have three samples. 
and so on. So underneath, it's kind of a parallelization occurs. There will be different jobs. They will probably go to different nodes on the galaxy cluster. So you're kind of uh, implicitly parallelizing your, your processing here. So this is just fundamentals of two most frequently used collection types, simple lists and uh, paired collections. And this is what you would encounter in real life. For example, uh, the uh, current COVID data, it's primarily, most of the sequencing in COVID primarily done with two platforms, with Illumina and Oxford Nanopore. Most of the Illumina reads are usually paired end. Of course, Oxford Nanopore is always single end. So uh, now I would like to uh, show some operations that you can uh, perform on the collections. And these, op these, op these operations are performed using a set of tools under collection operations heading on the Galaxy tool pane. So if you're working with any of the main Galaxy instances in EU, in US, in Australia, in, in Belgium, in France, uh, and so on, you, they will all have this uh, collection operation section. And so there's a variety of things that you can do. For example, we can flatten a collection. So what, what, what flattening collection will essentially destroy the hierarchy. So it will, it will convert uh, paired and collection into just a simple list of data sets. Or if you have collection with a more deep nesting, again, it will collapse it into a flat list of data sets. Uh, specifically for paired collections, there are zip and unzip tools. So in this case, I have, let's, let's try to unzip this collection. Let me show you what zip and unzip do first. So unzipping, splits paired the collection into two single collection and zipping obviously does the, the opposite thing. So let's unzip it. Um, so it's, uh, it's not a tool which requires too many parameters. So you can see that it creates two collections in the end and I can zip them right back in with, uh, with this tool again. So uh, you can see that in the interface of this tool, it says no data sets available. I mean, what is that? I have data sets here. Well, uh, this is because um, these, uh, these buttons here specify what type of inputs a tool takes. So uh, when, there's a, the, the, when this is selected, that means it's looking for a single data set. When that is selected, it means it looks for multiple data set. But when the folder is selected, then it's actually looking for collections. So let's uh, specify forward reverse and let's run it. So this will just zip it back in. Uh, so now I have you know, zipped collection. You can do these kinds of things. Um, there are also tools for filtering collections. For example, sometimes uh, you will get collections with empty data sets that again, in case of SARS-CoV-2, it happens quite often because many data sets deposited to short read archives actually don't have any SARS-CoV-2 data. So often you just, you don't have anything, right? It also sometimes happens that when you run a job on a collection, uh, it one of them may fail, maybe, you know, maybe there's some data issues or something else. And um, when this happens, you want to filter data sets in error from that collection. And uh, there is also a tool for that. So these tools are here, for example, filter failed, um, filter empty, uh, and so on. Um, so the um, so I already talked for twenty two minutes. I want to give some uh, time for uh, Wolfgang uh, as well. So let me jump to perhaps two most important tools in this set. Uh, if we look at the analysis flow again, let's imagine we're doing variant calling, and let's imagine we're doing variant calling. You know, in SARS-CoV two. So you start with many data sets, 
then you run BWA. The BWA will also generate many data sets. So once you uh, run a collection of paired end data through BWA, you will get another collection with BAM files. And that collection of BAM files will have 10,000 data sets because if you started with 20,000 paired ends, uh, you, have, you have this reduction here. So you're gonna, you start with paired collection, BWA will convert it into a flat list of BAM data sets. And then you continue doing analysis. For example, your covariance is will produce VCF data sets. Yet again, you're gonna have a collection with 10,000 VCF data sets. And then you do something else with these VCF data sets, such as annotating them, for example, with SNPF. So yet again, you're gonna have another collection with 10,000 data sets. And in the end, if you're, for example, using uh, SNP SIFT, uh, you, you, you're converting all of this into tabular, uh, into tabular format, which you, for example, want to use, want to analyze in, in Jupyter or, or in RStudio or something along those lines. But it's still 10,000 data sets. You don't really want that. Uh, you want to collapse all of this into a single data set. This is what uh, collapse data sets tool does. And so let's see how this works. Um, so, um, well, let's pretend this doesn't exist. Um, so, um, what I have here is uh, I have end result of some analysis. And this end result, well, in this case, it's some, some coordinates, but I want to combine this into a single data set that I can analyze down, down, downstream. I can, of course, merge it together and you know, I can just concatenate these data sets. But if you do this, what will happen is that you'll lose, uh, you will no longer know which, co which corresponds to, to sample one, which corresponds to sample two, which corresponds to sample three and so on. So let's use collection operations collapse tool. Um, I'm going to apply this to this collection. And so in this case, this file doesn't really have header lines. You know, sometimes you have header lines which describes what the fields are. So I'm just gonna uh, keep this, there's nothing to keep there. However, I want to prepend file names. So what this really will do, it will add the sample one, sample two and sample three designations to the, to the data itself. And I want to do this for every line in my data set. So prepend file name for each line in the data set. And let's run, uh, well, what did I do here? And let's just run this. Okay. So we started with a collection. But what we're gonna get in the end is not going to be collection, it's gonna be a single data set. And if we look at this data set, come on. I'm having some I think, internet issues on my end maybe. But you can see it here that now the name sample is prepended for each, um, uh, for each uh, line, for each line here. I think I, I messed it up with uh, when I was doing, uh, so I actually don't want to keep any header lines. So sorry, I misled you here. So let's rerun this again. We have this new style uh, toggle switches in the interface. So, so I, I kind of got confused what yes and no mean here. And so this is, so this is how it will uh, look like. Sorry, one of the uh, beauties of working from home is that sometimes they're starting to get uh, connection issues. Come on. Okay. 
sorry, live demos are dangerous. Anyway, so here it is. You can see that it's all labeled with the data set. So now you started with the collection, you bundled it together, you have one thing, you can analyze it downstream. Of course, in this case, I only have three samples, but you can imagine how this would work for, for many, many, many samples. And this is what I can, Rolf can will show you. So this is one really cool way of collapsing data, multiple data sets into one without losing uh, the knowledge what corresponds to what. So another uh, powerful tool here is, um, is column join. So uh, let's look at this. Um, so again, um, I have I have a collection with uh, some number of samples, and imagine that uh, I want to do a kind of a um, equivalent of an SQL join. So uh, in this particular case, these data sets they have. Um, position field and they have some change field. And I just want to generate one matrix. So for all positions, for the union of positions in this data set, just show me all the changes. So this is what column join will do. So essentially it will use the position column as like a hinge to hook all the data sets on it. So let's, uh, let's see how this would work. So this is the collection I would like to use. So this is identifier column. This is the column that I want to join the data sets on. I have one uh, header line here. You can see that that's commented out. And uh, I want to field, uh, I want to fill the fields where there is nothing with dots. Um, let's run this and see what it will produce. So the end result, once it's running, will look like this. So you will have the position column and uh, data from all of these data sets will be added. But for example, in this data set, I have uh, changes for position 10, 12, and 20. But in that data set, I only have for 10 and 12. So you can see that 10 and 12 will be filled and I will have an empty placeholder for, for that cell. For data set number three, I only have 10 and 20. So, uh, so 10 and 20 will be filled in here. Um, so um, this is kind of a short overview of what collections are for. The uh, YouTube link that I sent you just look through these videos and um, if I, I believe we're going to be sharing slides with you. So in these slides, all these images are clickable and by clicking on that image, you will be able to go to, uh, to a galaxy history with this data and um, sort of to experiment with it yourself. And uh, kind of the way this works is that uh, once you click on it, have some strange so if you click on it you will see this interface just click on plus clicking on plus will import that history into your account and you will be able to play with it thank you and now uh, to Volkan uh, Volkan do you want me to okay stop? thank you Anton yeah if you could stop sharing then I can start my own um just see this one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what we're gonna talk about now is, as Anton said several times, use of collections in real world situations, in real world scenarios where you have lots of data 
um, that you want to analyze in one galaxy history and where you really profit from this parallelism that collections offer. And the prime example, of course, for this is um, SARS-CoV-2 data, where collections are really at the heart of Galaxy for making this data flood that we're seeing there manageable. So as you might all be aware from the previous uh, webinar series, so for SARS-CoV-2 data, we're dealing with, I think more than 200,000 um, whole genome sequenced isolates by now. And of course, in principle, you could like analyze them one by one. You could create a workflow that does um, SARS-CoV-2 variant analysis, for example, uh, um, calls variants and produces a VCF file. Um, and, and you could run this workflow 200,000 times. And then you would end up with 200,000 different galaxy histories, each of them describing um, one SARS-CoV-2 isolate. But you're, when you start thinking about that, that sounds like complete nonsense. Yeah, why would you do that, run the same workflow 200,000 times and create a huge mess in your um, galaxy histories and you would never make, be able to make sense out of all of these separate data. So this is where collections really shine. And also, as I just hinted at, collections are really the perfect companion for galaxy workflows. And that goes both ways. So uh, collections are only half the fun if you're not using them in a workflow. And workflows, on the other hand, um, are far less powerful if, you, if they don't make use of collections. And this is what I want to show you next. So here's just an example of what we're doing with SARS-CoV-2 data. So we're usually trying to group um, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing data by study or bio project or whatever. So for example, we're analyzing um, data from different labs like this Boston data set here that's shown in the, in the screenshot here, 639 different SARS-CoV-2 samples that got sequenced, each of them paired and sequencing. So what we built here is a list of pairs of with 639 elements. So each of these 639 elements then inside of it has a forward and a reverse data set. So this is the pad and list type that Anton was already introducing. Um, and then the workflow runs in parallel on these 639 um, samples, produces 639 sets of mapped reads. Um, those get filtered, deduplicated, and so on. And then there are 639 variant calling jobs that are getting la launched, produce 639 uh, VCFs. Those get filtered and annotated with SNPF. And in the end, you have those 639 annotated variant call files. And it's all just one click on a workflow execute run button. And that's really it. So this is really the perfect combination of workflow and collections and you have an easy life with analyzing even massive amounts of SARS-CoV-2 data. In principle, as Anton said, we could scale this far more. We could put 10,000 um, samples into one collection. But as I said, we're trying to group some related data together here to, to have a bit of logic there. You could analyze all in one shot, but it would mean that for a short time, a public server like use Galaxy, you would have a lot of course dedicated to this workflow. Um, other users might, might see degraded performance for a while. And in the end, you don't want all this data in one big pot. Yeah, you actually want it sorted by bio projects. That's why that's why we're now doing this mostly in these, well, not small batches, but yeah, more reasonable sized batches of data. Um, here's another example for the um, Arctic patent data workflow that I was talking about in the last series. So in that case, it's more than 600 samples that are analyzed together, but this, the thing is the same. Um, the parallelization works without you caring as an end user about the number of samples in your analysis. You just pass a collection to the workflow and the workflow operates on that collection independent of what its size really is. 
And that's the beauty of it. Now, that's all nice and good looking at the history, but what does it really take to build such a workflow? So is this really complicated thing? Yeah. So Anton showed you how you build collections in your history and how you work with different tools that operate on collections um, from your history and executing individual tools one by one. But how do you really build a workflow that uses collections. So do you have to learn a lot of new stuff here too? And the answer is no, not at all. So building parallel processing workflows could not be simpler than it actually is in Galaxy because um, there is no difference really between a workflow operating on an individual input data set and a workflow operating on a huge collection of data sets. The only difference is really the input data set itself. So this is our Illumina pad and data variant calling workflow for SARS-CoV-2 data. And it illustrates both cases actually. So we feed a pad collection <clears throat> um, to this, into this workflow. That's one of the inputs here, the pad collection up here. And this undergoes then processing. And you see that these connectors, these noodles between the workflow steps are actually always consisting of several lines here indicating that these are steps that operate with collections. Um, you also have down here the SARS-CoV-2 reference genome, which is the other input to this workflow. And that's, of course, always the same reference genome, no matter how many samples you have, and it's always just one. Yeah, so that's why some of these tools, like the mapping tool, BWAMEM, which uses, of course, sequenced reads and the reference genome to do its job, they connect in two separate ways to two different inputs. So they receive a paired and reads collection as a paired collection input here, and that's a multi-line noodle thing here. <clears throat> and then it expects the reference genome. That's an individual data set. So it's just this single data set connector. Yeah. And that's all the difference. So as a user constructing this workflow, ideally you have to do almost nothing. It just depends whether your input data set is a collection or an individual data set. So to show you how this works, um, in practice, I can just like show this workflow in real um, in on usegalaxy.eu. So now I can modify things. And when you're constructing such a workflow, you decide for inputs that should go into it. And for this, you have this inputs <clears throat> um, section in the tools bar. That's when you're inside the workflow editor. And there I can now say, okay, my input should be a single data set. Then I could go for input data set. Uh, and then let's do something with that. Well, it's not a collection, so collection operations are not much help here. But let's do some text manipulation, compute an expression on every row of, of this input data set. A box gets added. I'm connecting it. And you see, because I selected a single data set as the input to this workflow. Um, the noodle here is a single data set noodle, and this part of the workflow will run on an individual data set at each step, right? If I do the very same thing, but initially for the input, I select an input data set collection. Um, it looks very similar. I also add a compute step here. Now I'm connecting those two. And this noodle is a multi-line noodle working on a collection. So Galaxy realized that this input, because I selected this type of input, is a collection. And then the whole workflow will be a collection-aware workflow. And that's really the whole difference. Yeah. So you start with a collection. It gives you a parallelized workflow. You start with a single data set. It gives you a single data set work, a workflow operating on a single data set. And that's all. It can't be easier than that. Um, so, um, well, that's also really nice. But then where do these collections come from, right? So somehow you need to get a collection in the first place of all your SARS-CoV-2 data, for example, to be able to feed it to this workflow. 
And um, Anton has already shown um, at least one way um, um, by doing this directly in the history user interface. Uh, so you go to the history panel in your on the Galaxy main page. Um, you go to the multi-select button here. So this little checkbox on top of your history, you check all the data sets you want to put into a collection and then you choose one of these options to build a data set list, the data set paired list also and so on. And that will return you a uh, collection that you can feed into one of these workflows. So that's one way. The other way is you can build the list directly while you're importing the data. So the data upload manager has tabs up here, which maybe you have ignored so far. Normally you're here in the regular tab, but you can switch to collection and then uh, say you want to upload your data as a list and you're getting a list directly after the upload finishes. <clears throat> and your third option is, of course, to use a tool that itself creates a collection. So there are a number of tools that we have, um, like the SRA download tool, um, which will accept a list of SRA accession numbers, then download the corresponding data and return it directly as a list or pad end list um, of data if it's pad and reads. Um, and that's another way. So if you have a list of SARS-CoV-2 related um, SRA accession numbers, you can pass it to this tool. It will return you a collection and you can feed that collection into one of our workflows. So that's also taken care of. There's one more complicated way that you need some that you sometimes need to take if your data comes from well, not exotic sources, but sources not directly supported by a tool in Galaxy. Um, this is when the rule builder comes into play. And I can quickly show you how that would work because um, I always find it impressive how um, easy that is really to do. So let me switch to this window here. So what I prepared here is, um, this is actually ongoing analysis on Use Galaxy EU, where we're monitoring COG UK sequencing data, SARS CoV 2 sequencing data as it gets submitted to the ENA, the European Nucleotide Archive. And um, so I have also a Galaxy workflow that accepts um, a text file with ENA metadata about which SARS CoV 2 samples are available through the ENA and their links. And then this workflow will check the file for pad end sequences, with which we are currently mostly interested in because it's the predominant sequencing done by COG-UK. Um, it splits those pad end files into libraries, which is also part of the metadata information of the ENA, um, uh, creates a collection um, of FTP links to the ENA, um, organized by library name. And then you can go into this collection. And for example, here I have 695 um, FTP links in there that will retrieve me 695 FASTQ files, um, where there's a headline 694 um, FASTQ files. Um, if I could somehow download those. So what that file contains is just the links. And so I demonstrate how you use those with the rule builder. So I just just go into select all of them. Um, and now go to the upload manager. And there I go to rule based and I want to build a collection. And now I put in my links. Oh, and then I say build. So right now, this is just the list of links, right? So the rule-based uploader could go to these places that the links point to and retrieve data. But the question is, how should it organize that data into a collection? And this is where we're going to tell the rule builder now by um, adding a few columns. And we're constructing these columns from the one column we have right now from these links. Because as you can see, um, this link contains the ENA uh, record identifier, and it also ends in either underscore one or underscore two dot fastqgz, depending on whether it's the forward or the reverse 
set of reads for the sample. So what I'm going to, to do now is use a regular expression here and I'm creating columns matching expression groups here. So now I just look at those links and I say, okay, um, they're starting with some um, initial path in the link, which I'm not interested in. So I just take arbitrary characters and ignore them until the first capture group here, which should be ERR followed by some digits followed by an underscore, followed by a single digit, and then ending in dot fastq gz. That's my regular expression. And I say this has two capture groups. That's the parenthesis here. So I first capture the ENA identifier and then the one or the two, and I do apply. And now I'm getting two new columns out of my one column that existed. And with that, I can now define um, how these columns should be used to retrieve the data and to structure it. And I'm saying add modify column definitions. And now I say the URL is in column A. So this is where the data lives. Then I add a definition for the list identifier. So we're gonna use the uh, record identifier from the ENA <clears throat> as the list identifier. Of, the, of each pad and list. And then I'm adding a pad and indicator and that is in column C. So that's one or two. Okay, then we are going to give that thing a name. So I just call it the demo list now, but you could use the library name or whatever. Um, and then the data is of type FASTQ Sanger GZ. And then I say, upload me that. Okay. And then we cannot watch that live now because it will take a while to retrieve these 694 data sets from the ENA, but I can show you that this has really been initiated. So here's our demo list of pairs in the queue. It's starting to download data now. And when it finishes, it will look like any of the others that are already downloaded. So when you go inside, you will find 367 items in this one. Um, okay, now facing Anton, same problem that things are a bit slow. Um, um, each individual item in there being named according to its inner identifier. And then if I go inside, I have a forward and a reverse data set in there. So this is structured perfectly for use with our variant calling workflows. And this is how you would get more or less arbitrary data into Galaxy structured in the way you want it. Okay, that's the rule builder. Really, really powerful tool. Um, and yeah, Galaxy wouldn't be Galaxy if everything would be perfect with collections. There are always a few rough edges and things that are annoying. But I mean, I prepared a small list here if somebody wants to go through it later when we publish those slides. But the important thing is all these can, you can live with all of these. And they might be a bit confusing to people first using collections and then many beginners first shy away from using collections because they're thinking, whoa, this is all a bit complex, not the way it used to look with single data sets, but really don't be frightened by these initial small hurdles. Yeah? You will find workarounds for all of these here in the list basically. Um, and collections are just fun to use and really it gives you so much power in your data analysis. Really, you should learn to, look, to, to use them. And actually, one important point is that um, collections are not just great for parallelizing things, but there are also these advanced uses, as I call them here, um, in which you can use collections basically to build really complex, you could almost say programming logic. Yeah? So you can really use collections to make workflows run like if they were structured programs. So for example, one thing that often gets asked is, can you have workflows with conditional logic in Galaxy? That's a common question on public forums. And the answer is 
not directly, not if you have a workflow operating on individual data sets, but with collections, you can mimic basically conditional logic and implement it through clever use of collections and those collection operations. And you can also not only parallelize with collections in the sense of parallelizing per data set that you have, um, but you can also use them to parallelize, for example, per line or per block in an input data set. Um, this is what's demonstrated here in this slide. So this is a workflow I actually stole from Marius Vandenbeck, who came up with that. Um, and I just like the idea so much that I wanted to show it here. Um, so what this workflow takes is a list of SRA accession numbers. Um, and then it uses the split file tool, which you'll find under collection operations, and splits this possibly very long list of accession numbers into one file per line. So each of the resulting files and text files in the resulting collection will have exactly one line there with one SRA identifier. And this then gets fed into um, the faster download tool for the SRA download, which will build a list of download results, which are themselves collections of sequencing data sets. And then Marius runs um, the kind of tool version of the rule builder um, on those resulting complex collections to retrieve the collections he wants. And what this essentially is, is a parallelization per accession number. So all these individual accession numbers will be run through several faster download processes um, and could potentially speed up the download speed, but I find it more fascinating from the perspective of building that programming logic into Galaxy through the use of collection tools. Yeah? So at the core of this idea is the split file tool that can grab a regular text file and split it per line or per column to different um, elements of a collection. Um, the other thing with the conditional logic is shown here. That's another building block I like very much. Um, this is the situation well, this is actually from a cancer variant calling workflow I built. And um, there you often have the problem that you want to call somatic variants. So the cancer, the tumor specific variants, but the workflow would also call germline variants and give you germline variant information about the patient sample. And now in your final report that you're creating in this workflow, you might not want to have that germline variant information present because um, not every clinician looking at the data might be might have the permissions to know about um, this very private detail about the patient, their germline variants, right? Um, so an oncologist should usually only care about the cancer variants in there. And so how do you do this in Galaxy? So if you have those two things and you want to conditionally show the germline data or not, but always the somatic variant data. What do you do then? Would you start two different workflows for that? That this one thing you could do, create a copy and in one of them just discard or not use the germline variant data. But instead you can also have a user input whether germline data should be analyzed or not. So depending on the kind of data and where it's supposed to go, you can quickly enable um, the analysis of the germline. And this also works um, entirely through con collection logic. So what I'm doing here is um, you put in the somatic variance data, the germline variance data and build a collection, a simple list from that. Then you relabel the elements in that list um, from a ad hoc constructed text file with created with this tool, create text file. Um, and the first element will be called somatic, the second germline. Then you're asking the user a uh, two choices question, analyze germline data or no germline. If the answer is germline, um, then this replace tool will do nothing. It will replace the germline line here in created by the create text file with the same value filter the list with 
um, somatic and germline um, and retain both elements. If the user says no germline, then it will replace that text germline in that file with no germline and filter this collection here with the identifiers somatic and no germline. It can't find no germline in there and it will not keep germline. So it will retain only the somatic um, element in that big collection. And this is um, then your resulting collection, depending on the user setting, will have either one or two elements and germline will be omitted or not. So this is how you could build conditional logic. Um, we're running a bit out of time. That's why, unfortunately, I cannot show Anton's workflow anymore because he has one around a very similar idea where um, in a given collection, he checks with um, standard Galaxy tools for um, the number of reads, mapped reads in a BAM file. And if that number is too low for meaningful analysis, he discards that element from the collection of mapped reads files and then only operates, works further with those elements of the collection with a sufficient number of mapped reads inside. So again, this is conditional logic in a workflow using similar tools as here. And just if you're looking for a recipe, so if you wanna do this, the general way this works is um, somehow you need to construct the text file of collection element identifiers. So you need to somehow get it a list of names in a collection that you want to work with and the others should be discarded. There's two ways basically to construct that list. So either you hard code it, like in my example, you use the create text file tool and really hard code in there, which element identifiers you wanna keep. And then you modify this list with the replace tool, for example, uh, based on user input. Um, or you obtain the element identifiers dynamically. And that's similar to what Anton showed you with collapse collection, where you add um, element identifiers to the beginning of the tabular file that collapse collection produces. Um, or you use extract element identifiers, which will give you all the identifiers present in your collection and you filter and modify these two outputs of one of these tools to retain only the ones you're interested in. And then you use the filter list tool also from collection operations to obtain an appropriately filtered collection. And for the user, all of this is completely transparent. Um, so let me just show you that maybe too. So I go to a pre-prepared history um, and let's do this one. Um, no, that's my germline somatic. I wanted to show Anton's so that you at least see it in action. So here's a collection of um, 12 different BAM files of different sizes. This is actually SARS-CoV-2 data, so mapped reads. Um, coming from different subgenomic RNAs of the virus. Um, there's diff very different numbers of reads for each of these subgenomic RNAs. And now we wanna just retain those that have a useful number of reads in there. So we run um, the workflow, the corresponding one with that conditional logic. Um, um, that's this one and Now, all the user sees is that they need an input collection and they need to specify a minimum number of mapped reads. Um, and let's say we require just 200 there to have something quickly. Um, so now it will discard um, every collection element out of these 12 that have fewer than 200 mapped reads inside of them or maybe that it really discards something. We go to, I don't know, 3000, run the workflow. And behind the scene, this is a very complicated workflow actually, but the user is not aware of all of this. So for them, it's just conditional logic and it all relies on collections behind the scenes. So this is how that workflow 
would look in reality. Uh, this is where the number of reads comes from. It goes in this extra processing loop for this collection that in the end discards here with filter list, everything we don't want, and then perform one demo step on that simplified list with just the retained parts. Um, yeah, so this is really how powerful collections are. And as I said, um, I really want to encourage everyone to use that. It's really in the beginning, it's a bit frightening, but after you get the hang of it, it really starts feeling more and more. You're seeing these collection operation tools really as building blocks for programs, and you can really create powerful, very cool workflows with that. So just give it a try. Um, it works surprisingly well. Um, the things that are still a bit annoying are getting better all the time with every Galaxy release. So just go and do it yourself. Use it. <laughs> um, that's it from my side. Let's see if the workflow actually started. Um, I can show that quickly. See if we're fast enough. Yeah, well, it started and it's hiding completed steps. And in the end, we would get a smaller collection out of that. But yeah, um, let's hand back over to questions and answers.